my name's John Chapman. Um, for a number of years now, uh, the Armed Forces Day, I've been very pleased to be able to give a bit of time and do some talks uh, for Dudley Council for their Armed Forces Day. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased, although it's a sad occasion in 2020 that we can't have Armed Forces Day, the fact that we're doing an Armed Forces Day via Zoom is going to be quite interesting. But it also means that we can look at um, Dudley Council and the various subjects that they're doing in a different light. So my history is, uh, is working with the Ministry of Defence and of course I, my subjects vary from Bletchley Park where I'm a guide, uh, World War One and World War Two, where I, I link up with the Guild of Battlefield Tour Guides which means we really go around touring cemeteries and, and places where people are buried but they're invariably buried where, where battles took place and some of the stories you can feel when you're there on the front line in France for example where a battle actually took place and that's quite, quite special. And then MI5, MI6, uh, secret intelligence services and that kind of thing. Now the reason th this, this particular subject is, is Bletchley Park and the story of Bletchley Park, the co-breaking station. It's quite an interesting place. Uh, when they went there uh, in 1938 to look at the grounds, Bletchley Park was up for sale. Wonderful mansion, uh, had about 30 rooms upstairs, uh, still has 30 rooms upstairs. And it was the Government Code and Cipher School that turned up at Bletchley Park to check it out and see whether it was suitable. They had to move out of London. London, of course, was likely to be bombed as the war uh, it, it came across. And Winston Churchill decided that he needed a code and cipher school. There was already a government code and cipher school at Bletchley Park from 19... Well, 1940, 1918, World War I, they were breaking codes. But, of course, code breaking goes back, uh, way back to Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth the first time. Um, the code breaking, the code and cipher school at Bletchley Park came out. We now know it, of course, as GCHQ, the Government Code and Cipher School, and that's now known specifically. And of course, it's now in Cheltenham and various other places. It's not just Cheltenham; it's about 15 different places. But they can't tell you that, and you must deny all knowledge of ever hearing that, of course, from me. The uh, the people at Bletchley Park turned up in 1939. There was about 130 of them and they were from the Government Code and Cipher School, as they called it. Come out of London, out of Whitehall, out of room 40 in the old war office, where there was 35 of them. By the time they got to Bletchley Park, they'd increased to about 130. By the end of the war, the people working at Bletchley Park were 7,500. Absolutely amazing where they came from. And they were working not just at Bletchley Park, but in various outstations all around. Listening stations all around the country who were listening to the Germans, obviously uh, the Japanese and the Italians and various others as well. And they were listening to their signals and reporting back to Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park was the centre, the hub, if you like, that took the signals, broke the signals, decoded the signals, and then sent the information out to their people in the field. So the Code and Cipher team had turned up at Bletchley Park in 1939, but they picked it for a number of reasons. Number one was that the place was on the market, but there were five other main reasons. The first of those five was that Bletchley Park is situated in Bletchley, which is now known really as Milton Keynes in Buckinghamshire, but it was also on the main motorway coming out of London. Now I know in World War II, or before World War II, we didn't have an M1, but it's very near the M1 now, but what the motorway was then, as we called it, was the A5. Watling Street, a Roman road, a straight road that went straight through Bletchley. So that was the number one reason, other than the fact it was on the market. Number two was the fact that it's on the main railway line coming out of London, out of Euston, right through Bletchley, and to this day, it's still a main line station stopping, even if you're going to Scotland, it will stop out of Euston, at Bletchley and then move on to Scotland. So that's how important Bletchley was then and to a certain extent is now. Number three was the fact that it was on the east-west railway line running between Oxford and Cambridge where our greatest minds taught our greatest younger minds and of course that's where they picked up a lot of people that worked at Bletchley. So from Oxford to Cambridge and Cambridge to Oxford people would come in east and west and get off at Bletchley Park and go to work. There was a one story which comes to mind uh, and it is worth telling. One of the professors at Bletchley Park uh, had, uh, was going to a meeting and he was on the station, walking up and down the station, pacing, looking really worried. One of the secretaries said to him, Sir, I see you're off today. Uh, she'd, she'd obviously just got off, off her train herself. She said, but whatever's the matter? He said, well, I, 
I, um, I, I can't find my ticket. And of course she said, so you're doing this every day? Surely, uh, if you just tell the train driver, they won't worry from that point of view. He said, it's not the case, he says. Until I find my ticket, I can't remember when I'm going to Oxford or to Cambridge. Now, that's the kind of people that were those types that worked at Bretsley Park. They were boffins. They couldn't work out whether they got the right coloured socks on, let alone do it whether they'd done their shoes up and where they were going for their meetings. But they could break German codes, and that's the kind of people that they wanted. Reason th uh, four for picking Bletchley Park was because it was only 1.7 miles away from a main power source and they knew they were going to need power for electricity and everything else and in the end what was going to be the first ever electronic computer which was built at Bletchley Park uh, and became what they called Colossus. And the last, uh, uh, but no means the least, was uh, a, a communication centre and that was a telephone exchange down the road where they could bring communications in and in fact a repeater station which is your communications that are coming up along the railway and coming in through telegraph and telex and that kind of thing of course that was more important we didn't have computers until it was invented in Bletchley Park in 1943 and the first ever computer started working in 1944. So you've seen a picture of the mansion, uh, you've, you've seen uh, a picture of the, uh, um, uh, well, you will see a picture coming up very soon of the refurbished huts at Bletchley Park. Now there were hundreds of huts, of course they had to look after 7,500 people towards the end of the war, but these huts still remain to this day, some have been rebuilt, unfortunately a few of the very important huts have gone. The huts in the picture that you're about to see uh, are huts three six uh, and three of course is next door to hut six which is obvious in front of huts three and six is hut one which is obvious and then right next door to the left hand side that you'll see of huts three six and one is hut eleven which of course is next door to hut eleven a now i know that sounds ridiculous but quite honestly the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing in the end they had hundreds and hundreds of huts but the if you were working in hut three you'd have no idea what was happening in hut six because your supervisor would say that signal has to go to hut six why you would have no idea and you never talked about it so therefore to get the signal from hut three to hut six a young chap or a young girl wouldn't run out with a clipboard with a signal on it oh no they'd put it in a shoe box and they'd have a broom handle and they would look and go to the end of the wall where it, between the two huts was a, was a box They'd knock on the door, the people in the hut next door would open it up, they'd put the signal inside the shoebox and push it through with a broom handle. They did upgrade in about 1942 and they had a sucking system where they put it into a sleeve and it would be sucked between one hut and another. And that's how the communications was. But the final two pictures are the stable yard at Bletchley Park, uh, which comes up in another talk which we're going to be doing about the women at war at Bletchley Park and the Polish Memorial, which is the only memorial until the Queen unveiled a memorial to the co-breakers that's actually at Bletchley Park. And that's because the Polish were absolutely critical in what they did for breaking the Enigma machine and bringing an Enigma machine to Bletchley Park for the co-breakers to work on. We now have about nine Enigma machines at Bletchley Park in cases that are uh, almost unbreakable and very well secure, but they do tell a whole story from some of the top code breakers, including uh, Hitler's right-hand man's own Enigma machine, which we very rarely get out because it's probably worth a quarter of a million pound, if not more. The, co the Polish memorial really says thank you to the Polish, and you'll see it as you walk through the yard at Bletchley Park, where you see this, what looks like a book, opened up, and on the left-hand side it's in Polish, on the right it's in English, and there are three of these monuments around the world. One, uh, a forest, the Pyro Forest, uh, just outside Warsaw in Poland. The second one, which is actually in uh, the embassy, the Polish embassy in London, and the third one, which we feel is the most important one, which is at Bletchley Park, uh, commemorating what the Polish did for us. The stable yard, which is really quite something, is where Turing first came, Alan Turing first came, uh, and uh, worked in, uh, in, 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 in the Cottage Three, sorry, in Cottage Three in the stable yard, uh, with Dilwyn Knox. Dilwyn Knox was a mad Welshman, as we called him, who first broke the Enigma machine in World War II, just after World War uh, I, just before World War II, when the Enigma machine was first invented. The Enigma machine, of course, which we're going to talk about in Codes and Ciphers, was not invented uh, by the Germans, it was invented by the Dutch, 
and it was invented as a cipher machine in World War I because the Germans were breaking through the Dutch lines and the Dutch needed to communicate to each other and in doing so they needed some kind of code machine hence they invented a cipher machine which later became an Enigma machine because the Germans were able, because it wasn't patented, were able to copy it and redesign it again into their own machine. So we're going to move now on to a second talk, which will come in a short while, but I hope you'll enjoy your day at Himley Hall and then come back and see Himley Hall in real life with the grass growing as it is at this moment in time and the sun about to bleed out.